Okay, everyone, uh, this is Crypto Wednesdays, episode 29. We are back from our multi-year hiatus. We've actually been back for a few weeks now, and I'm happy to see that the buzz and the audience is building. Uh, I'd like to welcome back my wonderful co-host, Anastasia. Wave and say hello. We, we need hello, to wave. Fantastic. And today our topic is AI, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, new economic possibilities. So I'm going to introduce one of our famous three panelists, and he'll introduce his co-panelists since he put this all together. Uh, Vinay, give, it, give us a real brief version of yourself and the others, and then we'll go between you three and sort of get your background. So sure. Okay. So ahead. three and, quick and I'm happy to have you back. This is your second time on the show. Yeah. Uh, so friend. three quick facts about me. Uh, I was my first year being paid 100% of my income in digital cash was 1999. Um, uh, I was the la launch coordinator for material uh, Ethereum in 2015. So I actually ran the launch process, uh, and I now run a company called Materium, which basically handles the interface between the blockchain and the real world. So you can buy and sell physical things like real estate as NFTs. Uh, Ruben, John, who wants to go next? Great, Thank Ruben, you. go for it. Just Ruben. <laughs> Ruben, I, Ruben, I appoint you. Go. Yes, all right, I'll, I'll go. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ruben Daniels. Um, my, my history is in, in software development. Um, in 2010, I built a company called Cloud9 IDE, the first web-based uh, development environment uh, that was picked up by Amazon. It's now part of the AWS suite. Uh, I now focus on um, on regeneration and specifically with, with memory for a re regenerative AI platform that empowers users and developers through data and connectivity, um, really figuring out how we can have new economic possibilities that are in tune with life and nature and um, and developing conscious ways to to deal with data. I was hoping for a second when you said regenerating memory, you, you meant humans, because I could use some of that. <laughs> humans are included in nature yes okay phew. that's a relief uh john please well i'm uh, john ennis i'm the ceo of neoswap i'm originally a mathematician i have a phd in math i did my postdoc in computational neuroscience then i founded agora which is a enterprise ai services business um neoswap is something i've been working on most of my life actually i tried to do it in the real world in 2017 what it is is solving the problem of finding best multi-way trades in groups including assets and currency. So it's not barter, it's, but it's a kind of a new type of commerce. Uh, it's not, it's very hard to do in web two, but with web three, it becomes really possible. And it's a nice blend of AI and web three. We have a collaboration going with uh, Vinay and Materium because you know, our vision is that this technology, which right now is being used to trade digital collectibles, digital assets, and find its way out to the real world into supply chain or inventory management, you know, or find wines, real estate, this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, happy to talk about you know what we see as new economic possibilities with the, our technology. Fantastic. Okay, and just for the people watching, I played around with the chat settings. is is not quite what it was last time, but when we get to the group conversation, uh, you'll be able to raise your hand to speak, or you should be able to, and then we'll unmute you and have you join once we get to that part. Um, so, gentlemen, thanks for the thanks for the fast version. Um, but now I want to go through you yet again and do a slightly, John, you, you began to touch on it, but I want to do a slightly deeper dive on what you're individually working on now, whether it's NeoSwap or memory or material, just go a bit longer on that so that we can get what the company is and the direction. And then we'll start discussing how you're interacting with each other and the possibilities of AI and blockchain leading to commerce and advancement. So I'll just stick with the same order of Vinay, go, go deep on material. Sure. So, um, I mean, we basically uh, solved the problem of getting physical things to trade on chain, you know, and we solved it in a way that makes lawyers happy. So, you know, when we built this company, we always said that the uh, target customer was the general counsel of Fortune 500 company. And what we were trying to do was get that person to say yes to selling the physical assets of that company on chain. And this is a thing we've achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're right now in discussions with companies that have all told uh, very close to a trillion dollars of physical assets in their vaults or in their real estate portfolios. Um, 
And you know that's a kind of blockchain transforming offer. If we could get you know hundreds of billions of asset uh, of dollars worth of physical assets trading in crypto, then that shifts the whole perception of the crypto space as being something which is largely about IP or kind of toy currencies into being something which is entirely driven by real world transactions. And I don't mean toy, toy currencies, I mean Bitcoin, but I mean like shitcoin projects. Um, no, no, so, no, and I, the, w- one thing that's always troubled me because I'm a fan of took. Are you? Are you tokenizing the asset fundamentally? Or so we're not securitizing, that? right? One NFT, one house, one NFT, one apartment. If somebody wants to securitize, you take that NFT, you lock it inside of a smart contract, and then you issue, issue fractional tokens against that. But we ourselves do not securitize. That's specialized work. You, there are agencies that do that. That's not us. What we do is we nail down the reality of the physical asset so that the buyer of the NFT genuinely gets the physical asset. And if there's a defect, they get compensation. Okay, so you're you're not fractionalizing. You're doing we don't fractionalize. For, you're doing we're, one we're, one. We're a, yeah, we're a Go step ahead. in the fractionalization chain, but we ourselves don't fractionalize. And what this the, the relevance of this to AI is that what we have is a machine readable description of legally verified data about mm-hmm. physical assets that can be transacted digitally. So you basically show your AI system our catalog. It says, right, I want apartment thirty seven, and I want that diamond. I think they're underpriced. And it enables people to do these transactions in a pure digital format with AIs making the decisions. So it's basically like Amazon for AIs. Okay. Now, if if I to use your example, I think it lands a little bit easier. But you, you have a diamond, for example, and you got your GIA or other certification. Yeah. How exactly, in a way that would make a general counsel happy, are you forming that legal claim relationship, whatever you want to call it? Okay. So. Um, you're presented with an NFT. Yes. When you buy the NFT, a payment is made to a set of third-party certifiers who offer legal warranties to you as the NFT buyer. So say that number cert- certifier number three is a law firm. The law firm says, we have seen the GIA report on that gem. This is a copy of that GIA report. We will certify that we got this GIA report directly from GIA and that it refers to this object, which is currently in storage. You pay us 10 basis points on the transaction for the right to rely on that fact. We don't vouch that the GIA report is accurate, but we do vouch for the fact that it's genuine. And then every So time is that a time. property? Is that a direct property ownership or property right? Or is it a contractual right that when enforced gets you the property? So it depends whether you're dealing with real estate or whether you're dealing with something like a vaulted asset. So mm-hmm. what you have is a contractual right backed by warranty. So- Okay. I say, I warranty that you as the owner of this NFT will be able to retrieve this physical asset from the vault. If you try and retrieve it from the vault and you can't, at that point, you make a warranty claim. And the warranty claims are managed by an arbitration tribunal in the UK, which uses a set of rules called the UK Jurisdiction Task Force Digital Dispute Resolution Rules. Those rules were created by um, the master of the rules, who's the head of commercial justice for the UK. Mm. And uh, the master of the rules, well, civil justice, I should say, uh, and the master of the rules uh, brought together a set of industry experts to give input into those rules. Materium was part of that group, helped to draft the rules and are quoted in the rules. So the arbitration mechanism that handles the claims about digital assets is fully, fully digital and is ready to handle these kind of disputes. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, Ruben, deep dive on memory. Sure. So... Uh, memory, as I mentioned, is a regenerative AI platform. It re- revolves around this thing called a pod, a personal online data store that stores your personal data from all around the internet, where you can create data and have a network between other pods that builds um, a web of trust that allows you to share information. It's a new new version of, of the internet in some way that really helps people move from uh, fear-based to regenerative AI with an AI layer that only reports to you. And it's really designed for, for life, learning from nature instead of a mechanistic view, uh, for collaboration instead of competition and sovereignty instead of control. So uh, if you think about uh, data right now, it's all siloed in, in, in these various organizations. And if we change that to having uh, data controlled by, by ourselves, by, by people, we start building the basis for a community with inclusive design processes. Um, and so it's a, it's a radical shift here where we want to you know, stop repeating these mistakes that we've made with, with data 
and control that data uh, so that we can create a world that's that nourishing to us. Um, and, and we provide the, the, the confidence to individuals and, and communities to, to participate in how they use their data and their connections to empower them to, to make decisions and, and grow an ecosystem, including developers and, and, and model makers who want to use uh, the memory and the pod for the well-being of users. Um, our future vision is really to, to uh, enable these communities to, to parent the future of humanity with, with a focus of well-being and using artificial intelligence to, to guide collective human will. Um, and um, I think the connection with, um, with, with, with blockchain is that we envision a world where everyone has their personal blockchain that, um, that they uh, manage together with a group of their peers that allows them to, um, to have full sovereignty over, um, over their data, their, their data assets, and who gets access to them. Everyone has a personal blockchain or there's, a, there's many consortium blockchains? It, uh, it's a it's a personal personal blockchain. So everyone has uh, has a personal blockchain um, within this web of trust, and each um, uh, each individual uh, gets to um, gets to manage and help within the people that they trust their their blockchain as well. Now I I, do, I gotta just ask, how do you secure a personal blockchain? So um, think about it as uh, essentially um, a, a blockchain that's secured by all the nodes that, that you trust, so all the people around you. So if I have 100 friends, then together um, uh, we, uh, we, we secure the blockchain together. So uh, it's um, um, uh, a blockchain secured by, by the peers that I trust. It's interesting. It's a, it's a distributed network of distributed networks. In a way, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, exactly. Now, let me let me let me dive in a little bit more. I have my I'm not Mr. AI guy, though. I'm working on it. My, I've, I've dabbled in Mid Journey and ChatGPT, and not the not the military grade stuff. My very neophyte experience with ChatGPT is that when it achieves holistic humanity oriented goals, it gets neutered in the process, and I can't mm -hmm. quite get it to tell me the, the truth about things I want to know about. Or even take a. There was just something that happened where you know I, I guess it passed the bar exam, and but the latest version of it says talk to your lawyer. So, which is annoying because well, I am the lawyer. They, they keep lobotomizing it every time it does anything. Yeah. I know, but yeah, you know yeah, someone's yeah. not lobotomizing it. China's not lobotomizing it. Russia's not. Yeah, well, right, the safety layer is a big topic. So yeah, yeah. That's, well, we're, yeah, yeah. Actually, we're, we're definitely gonna hit that in this. But uh, I'm gonna stick on Ruben for a second. Ruben the. Suppose I subscribe to all your goals or your gestalt or your framework for looking at the world. I, 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 how do you do this with AI and have it tell the truth? It's a very Asimov, Asimov, type, Asimov type question, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and this is uh, in, you know, a really important part. We believe that all AI is, is political, right? It's, 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 it's impossible to not have um, some set of values integrated in, in the AI. And, and this is really based on the, the data set, right? The, the, the data that it learns from. And so rather than going around the internet and, and, and just having um, you know, random data come in and then trying to neuter that, what if we come together as a community and uh, provide the data and not only public data, but the, provide our, our own personal data in a way that secures uh, the privacy uh, protects the privacy of individuals, yet we collectively then decide within a community what uh, the values are based on the data that we provide to it. Uh, and when we do that, we don't have to neuter uh, this AI because it actually um, uh, is trained with, with, with data and with, with knowledge that, that we as a community have. Um, and we okay. think that that's really the, the future of this. John, bear with me a second, because you know I'm like a dog with a bone. Yeah, I just want to stay. I just want to stay yeah. with this because this is a troubling topic for me. I, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's already happening that people are beginning to use AI as a Google replacement. They're they're not searching in Google or somewhere else to get the information and then feeding it into the AI. I think they're going to the AI to find out what the information is, and you're, you're kind of getting. A, I think you're in danger of a closed loop unless you're going to like appoint guardians, otherwise known as censors, around the border of what knowledge is allowable to put into the AI. And what about someone within that circle who, I mean, mm -hmm. does, can't mm -hmm. get to that? What, what do you do? Yeah, so 
Um, and and please don't leave the show. I'm I'm asking because I'm curious because <laughs> I I'm, I'm wrestling with these ideas myself. So I'm, I'm asking absolutely, provocatively because I hopefully you have a better knowledge than I do. So so um, uh, I think here there there is the um, so we very much believe in the cooperative model, mm -hmm. right? Uh, of of people cooperating and making uh, decisions democratically or or consensus based or consent based to 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 make decisions rather than having you know corporations or or governments making these decisions. Um, a community can, through dialogue, come to decisions on what actually should maybe be prevented or should not be answered or, or what, what is the boundary. And based on that, um, uh, uh, manage their AI and, 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 and build that. Um, so I think that, that that's the answer. I, I do have a deep trust in the end when people come together and they, they learn the skill of uh, being a democratic agent to, to make these decisions on, on what should and should not be allowed. Uh, and what do what do they want their children to use, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that that's that's a much better process to get to an AI that that's responsible. You, you, you just, you just, sorry, you just gave me a, a version of the humanity where there's like the 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 high school GPT, the college GPT, the PhD GPT, and then you serve the military GPT, and you know put in your digital identity here for the level of access that you get to the truth or controversial things. I, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll tease this out. And Anastasia, sorry, I interrupted right. you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just, I was just going to ask, like, so in this case, do the participants of the system define some sort of values that others would see, or do they only define what they see themselves? So like, would you actually be going after a certain like truth committee, which actually you know, pushes a certain narrative, and if not, how do you really avoid it? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the way that uh, we're imagining this is that there will be many, many um, uh, AIs, so not just a single one. And as a community, we, we can decide which ones we use, which ones we open up to, to others. Uh, and, and with that, get a diversity of, of opinions, diversity of perspectives that the various AIs can have dependent on, uh, on the data that's trained, right? So if we're, uh, let's say, um, part of a regenerative um, uh, 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 you know, community or community of communities that all decide together, okay, we're going to train this AI with, with a lot of knowledge that, that, that we have about um, uh, uh, regeneration and about uh, uh, nature and so on, it will become a specialist in, in this area and, and others can then use that and they'll come in and ask questions about that. And so there will be various specialized uh, AIs that, uh, that you can access and, and go to uh, for specific purposes. Interesting. All right, so John, you, would, you, sorry, yeah. Anastasia, go ahead. It's okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so like in this case, you basically, you're basically giving user a choice on which AI to go to to ask like specific question or get specific information. But I feel like why ChatGPT became so popular and this Gordon, you said that some people are using it to substitute Google is because they're trying to simplify the way they consume information. So instead going to Google and having this like five pages or at least two or three different pages they need to scan through, they just get like one single answer, right? No, absolutely. Uh, there, there's certainly um, uh, uh, these sort of very baseline uh, uh, features uh, that, that we expect of, of, of any of these um, uh, AIs. And um, having, having a personal AI that, that has a, a mental model of the world that's coherent with, uh, with, with, you know, with, with you or with your community is, is, is super important. And so that's certainly the baseline. Okay, uh, and then P Peter, good to see you. Do me a favor, turn off your video for now, but it's a pleasure. Good to see you. Yeah, Anyways, so tell us about NeoSwap. Yeah, well, I mean, it's actually interesting. There's some overlaps with what Rube is talking about, where with multi-way trading, you know, you can bring together a group of people. People own things that they, maybe they don't value as much as other people in the group. And through the combination of, the, where, where we use AI is for individualized price prediction or price discovery predicting how much people in the group value the different items that are in the ecosystem. And then what we can do is we can find trades. I can show you some examples, maybe some pictures would help here. Um, all right, let me share my, I can, can I share my screen, Anastasia? Or is it, I, I do, how do I say your name properly? Anastasia. 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 Um, yeah, let me pull this over and I'll take you guys through some examples. 
And then I can show sort of a demo because there's different levels of what we're doing. Uh, Multi-way trade finding is, oh, can you enable? Are, are you able to share screen? No, it says uh, host disabled. Okay, let me just, okay, now you should be able to. Okay, great. Yeah, so this is um, an introductory uh, tweet thread. Let's see. Do you all see yes. my screen? Cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so here's an example of a multi-way trade where you have maybe 12 people and about 60 items being traded all at once, okay? And what's different about this is normally you always have this liquidity problem in markets where you have you have things that maybe other people want and you want things that other people have, but you don't have enough money to buy any of those items. So then you have this sort of chicken and egg situation where maybe everybody wants your items but they don't have enough money to buy them. You want other people's items. Let's say you have to take out loans or do work or whatever. And you end up with, and especially in the NFT world, you have this problem where commerce is possible, but because of the lack of liquidity, it just it doesn't happen. Uh, and it, what you see that with NFT collections, something like 95% of NFT collections on ETH have done less than one ETH volume on the secondary markets. And a, the, a very large percentage, it depends on the chain, but again, about 95% of NFTs listed on the secondary markets never sell. They just they hang out there forever. They hang out there for six months. So you have a problem where things are stuck. Okay, yes, at the very top, you know, we're, Ruben, you're talking a little bit about inclusivity. That's also relevant here because right now, the, certainly in the NFT space, the financial market is very exclusive. Where you have a small number of whales that are basically flipping NFTs, and you have this whole middle class that's shut out of the economy because there's not enough liquidity to get economic activity to happen. And so what we want to do is take... Now, we have on-chain data about people. We have the data that people um, provide to us during the events. We also have surveys and kind of on their way to try to understand what people want. Okay, and The personalized data you're talking about, Ruben, could also be very useful for predicting how much people value different items. Okay, And so then the whole point is, if you know how much everybody values all the different assets in the ecosystem, then you can combine that, those predictions, with trade finding. And notice that this is not barter. In this case, we still have Stacks token moving around. Okay. Am I, um, you know, I, so I'm sorry. I, I just uh, reclaimed. Oh, it's disabled. Okay. Uh, you um, should be able to do it now. Or hold yeah. on one second here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. And yeah. I've also locked the meeting so no one else is joining. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, yeah, but anyway, this is not barter. This is kind of an important distinction. People look at this sometimes and think, oh, it's barter. Well, barter has all sorts of problems with scaling, okay? Um, in a barter, you've got unequal value and you have no good way of matching that up. And we can still use currency. We just don't need nearly as much currency. With 10% of the amount of, um, like I can show you guys experiments on this, but even with 10% of the amount of liquidity that you might normally have, you can get commerce to happen. Now, it's also interesting for situations where you've got primary sales. Or here's a situation where you've got one seller, many buyers, a bunch of items for sale, the liquidation event or primary sale for an artist. What's the best way to sell these items into the group? Okay, we can also solve that problem. And then uh, let me show you where this is all kind of headed. Should we go to our website? I just, I just like that you use Brave. Oh, thanks. As your browser. Okay. So here I'm logged into Stacks. I'm going to press this button and it's going to propose a trade to me. Okay, so we have access to a bunch of items in our treasury we're bringing in more and more kind of market makers to be counterparties in these trades um eventually people will pre-sign contracts so that we'll have the ability to trade okay so here we go so what it's doing is it's asking me would i like to give up this nft for this nft and a little bit of money and actually that is a good trade i don't particularly care for this but i don't really care about that either i'm going to get paid so that's good so i can accept and um, in a few minutes, I'll be able to sign. This is on the Stacks blockchain, which is a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. That will eventually integrate with the chatbot, where you'll be able to describe the sort of thing you're looking for, or what it is you're trying to get rid of. You know, you kind of describe your intentions. And then we'll be able to work out a multi-way trade that helps. You know, it's a little, it, it's, it's not technically generative AI, but it will act like a generative AI. Because it'll, just like you go to mid-journey and you describe what you're looking for, you know, say, show me, basically, when you think about mid-journey, you say, imagine, and then you describe what you're looking for, and it does its best to produce a picture, and it may or may not be able to succeed. Um, I mean, it does a pretty good job most of the time. 
Chat, chat GPT is similar. We want that same sort of experience, a sort of something that's like a generative AI for economic activity, where you can say, looking for a board ape, what's the least expensive way I can get one? And so you wallet it and it looks at what the other people want and says, okay, uh, Gordon, if you're willing to give up your CryptoPunk and three ETH, we can get you a board ape. What do you think? And under the hood. Is that, is that a good deal these days? Well, board apes are collapsing. So who knows? I don't haven't really been <laughs> tracking that. I know it's been going down. Um, but whatever it is, that's that's the point. It'll make a prediction. And it should be a trade where you prefer what you're getting to what you're giving up. Uh, that's kind of our big vision. We want to bring this to supply chain, to inventory liquidation. There's anywhere where there's a central hub, where when you think about how things are moving, like in supply chain, this happens all the time. Stuff goes to some sort of distribution center, it goes back out. Well, if you know directly where things need to go, you can skip that middle step, especially when you think about Internet of Things, and you think about all the drone technology, all this you know, autonomous vehicles that are coming, especially autonomous boats, which are really mm -hmm. like underestimated. Um, you can move things. I thought, I thought you were about to say they're underwater, and I was about to laugh. Yeah. Well, they're underestimated. You know, people talk yeah. about autonomous cars, but autonomous boats are actually a very good use case. Um, but anyway, you have things moving around directly rather than always going because we have this kind of hub and spokes model all, all over the place. Yes. And what we want to do is get fully distributed commerce. So that's the kind of promise of, of what we're working on at ES1. Uh, John, can I come in on the back of that for a sec? Sure. Um, so the place where this stuff really begins to light up, um, when we start talking about the overall goal of getting reduced environmental footprint for the world, mm -hmm. is right. where we start talking about shopping, right? Yeah. So you buy something, you go, oh my goodness, I really want this new thing. You know, here's the thing that we want. And you know, what we want is a world in which when you buy something, you use it for a while, you decide you're done with it or you're leaving town, it's too big to take with you. Selling it is as easy as buying it, right? Because we have an e-commerce system which is fantastically well suited to delivering things to you, but is terrible at getting the things back out again, right? right. It's just set up for this kind of one-way pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, could I share screen for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, so... You take the, the kind of NeoSwap swap technology, right? All of this ability to move the stuff around. And then what you take on the physical side is the authenticator tags. And there are a bunch of different companies doing these things, right? Um, and so these things are embedded into the objects. You know, the, all the significant assets that you have in your house have a tag like this on it. And then when you want to, to get rid of the thing, you know, you have an asset passport that describes what the thing is, why it's valuable. You maybe get an updated third-party condition report. And then at that point, you can take the thing directly into the NeoSwap system and find somebody else that wants it. And that notion that the goods just bounce around and around and around inside of a big city, London, New York, mm -hmm. Paris, LA, you just have this fluid commons of things that are digitally tagged property you take a bunch of stuff that you don't want. You hit trade, 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 trade. You have a bunch of things that you do want. You say, get, 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 get. And over a period of a few hours or weeks or maybe months for things that are liquid, the things that you don't want vanish and the things that you do want appear. And then you use them for a while and then you get rid of them again exactly the same way. So what it provides is this way of getting out of the consumer society that we're currently in, in a way where people still have radical access to goods and services. They can get a huge variety of stuff, but it doesn't come with the environmental footprint and it doesn't come with the financial cost because you get tired of surfing, all your surf gear goes, all your mountain bike gear arrives, you get tired of mountain bike gear, you just say, okay, I want to swap this stuff for windsurfing. Yeah. And everything just moves around in this liquid pool. And I'd like to add to that. I think sensors are very important because if there's sensors on these items, they can detect, if an item hasn't been moved in six months, for example, it could start to nominate itself to be traded. Where, you know, Vinay, you talked about like they're mm. expressing an intent. Oh, I want to get rid of this. Well, really, maybe you want to, maybe you're willing to get rid of any item in your house for the right price, right? Yeah. So, in some sense, all the items you own are up for trade. It's just a question of what you're going to get. And that's where the predictions, predicting how much you value every item, that's important. And that's going to change over time, right? And then predicting how much you're interested in various items. This is where, Ruben, I think your data is very, your data are very interesting. Because okay, actually, let, like let me jump in one second. So one thing I was I thought I was playing with a few years ago was when you tokenize everything, separate from fractionalization, securitization, when you tokenize everything and everything becomes sort of liquid on, on chain, it'd be yeah. neat if those things started to gain 
some degree of self-awareness or knowing how they should move. Something, you know, something beyond internet of things, but a degree of, hey, if I am now worth X, not, not a smart contract saying if that thing is now worth X, do something, but the object itself checking its own price, checking how long it's been on the shelf and saying, hey, if I, you know, this jar of mayonnaise has been on the shelf for so long, you know, move, move to this shelf. And, and I, I wonder, I don't know, John, what you said was evocative of that, which is, mm -hmm. is something well, you know, that hasn't add, moved for yeah. six months. It kind of knows to do something with itself. Yes. And what I would add to this, and this kind of circular smart economy we're talking about, individualized prices are very important in that we're used to thinking about the market price. What's the price of the mayonnaise? But actually, in real life, that mayonnaise is worth different things to different people. Right? Every item is actually worth a different amount to different people. And there's just been no good mechanism to leverage that. Because if you go to a store and different people are seeing different prices, that's really kind of patently unfair. But if you have multi-way trading going on, and there isn't a clear price for each item, it's just that people are preferring what they're getting to what they're giving up, and it's good for everybody, then those individualized prices can become functional. Where right everyone now, has the experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think I heard you say, I mean, is currency still involved in this training or is it goods and services for goods and services? No, currency is still involved, but it's just making up the value differences. So you need a lot less of it. Okay. So there are prices. The, the items are selling for prices, but you don't see them. In a multi-way trade, what you see is you're getting... Now, sometimes you do have sales. Sales are special cases of a multi-way trade. But a lot of the times what you see is something like what I just showed you. Would you like to get this item in exchange for these items? And maybe, you know, on another side of it is some money. Right. But in that situation, it's a lot harder to see what the price is of a specific item. You're it's, it's you're getting more into the value judgment. Do you like what you're getting more than what you're giving up? Right. It's a different question from are you willing to pay this price for the item? So that's the mindset shift we have to get to is people thinking about the value of the transaction to them instead of just the price, because actually things are worth different amounts to different people. How do you evaluate like what certain thing would would be worth to the specific individual? Like what data you would be collecting and in what way? Like would it be some sort of form or what do you analyze? Well, okay, first off, this is where blockchain really helps because you have a lot of public available information about all the transactions that have happened, right? So for every person, for every item, you have all sorts of patterns where People like this person have tended to pay this price at this time for these sorts of items. So you have those kinds of patterns that emerge. And that's where the machine learning comes in, making those predictions. But other data that we have, we have events where people show up, they list items, they say how much they would sell them for, and then they bid on each other's, other people's items. They set a spending limit, they bid on each other's items. Those data are informative, okay? We also have surveys where we ask people things like, okay, you know, here are four, four items, maybe one of them is some amount of currency, which... Do you want the most, which do you want the least? That's a kind of standard market research survey. Uh, it's called Mac, It's called best worst scaling. That's a technique we can use. Uh, we also have kind of, we're working on a Tinder interface where we show people, here's an NFT at this price. Swipe right if you would pay that amount. Swipe the left if you wouldn't. So a lot of survey techniques that we can use. And then you have actual behavioral data from whether people are accepting AI proposed trades. And this is where, you know, I'm thinking with, with Ruben, it could be very good because there's all sorts of other signals that can tell us about the people and what they want, right? And so what you really want is a giant matrix of predictions. We have all the people, we have all the items, or at least you have all the items that are relevant to the people. And then you're able to predict at each moment, how much do the people value the items, okay? And then with the trade finding, you figure out, okay, how do we propose trades to these people? Or when people say they're looking for trades, how do we find trades that are good for them and that are good for everybody else? So that's the kind of big vision here. And so I guess you can also like look at people who are, um, indulging in similar activities and picking similar items and then you're making suggestions for others. I think that Amazon was like working on some, you know, delivery of goods that according to their algorithm would be interesting to this specific user. And then if they don't, they just send it back. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So what we would have would be an extension of that because that's a special case where they're proposing a sale, essentially. Right. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Because if you get the item at your house and you have a price that's proposed to you privately, then, yeah. so maybe they also are, this idea of individualized pricing, I think is inevitable that given all of the advances in, I mean, when you think about the internet distributed systems, you've got all sorts of um, reasons why individualized pricing, like Uber, that's later, Uber has surge pricing, that is individualized pricing, 
And so it is starting to come. But I think for it to really arrive, you need multi-way trading or it's just going to look unfair. Yeah. And this thing about different people valuing things in different ways, I mean, this is the essence of commerce. If everybody viewed everything as having exactly the same value, then at that point, things would simply sit static. But, you know, like inside of finance, the great engine is that young people want to buy risk from old people because young people want, you know, things which will generate more return and they've got more flexibility. Older people tend to want fixed returns because they're retiring and they want to know what their future income will be. And these are the kind of great long-term macro drivers for uh, trade. So the idea that you've got a world in which AI systems basically understand your values and then trade on your behalf and bring you the things that you want. I think the prospect here is for a new form of commerce, which is completely delightful, right? I mean, it, it sounds kind of like delightful, but actually looking for things is hard work. You know, if you know anybody that's really into fashion or camping gear or mountain bikes, they spend an enormous, inordinate amount of effort figuring out the right equipment, figuring out what's currently cool, trying to analyze, you know, staring into their own souls, trying to figure out what they want. And the idea that a machine could just be like, hey, I saw this thing, it's really what you want. Would you like to see one of these? It's like, wow, that's so much cooler than the thing I have already. Yeah, and you know what? The thing that you have already, if you get rid of that and that old pair of shoes, you haven't worn one of these will turn up in your doorstep. Oh my God, wow. Right. Sorry, Vinny, Vinny I, I, I may be missing the obvious, but don't we have that on Netflix and Amazon now? Yeah, well, can exactly. I say, but it's one directional, right? It's just selling, it's recommending sales to you, but it's not recommend. It's, it's recommending basically purchases or consumption to you, but it's not, what we're talking about is this all, right now you've got two-sided marketplace. We have buyers and sellers, right? Oh, what I we see want you're is saying, all, hey, hey, Gordon, aren't you tired of these shoes? Maybe you want yeah, to we're gonna, for this. Yeah, that's right. Now it's it's a two-sided recommendation engine. So we're not only are we proposing that your things are going to come in, but we're going to propose outbound activity for you as well. So now it's an all-sided marketplace where everybody's, a, and people aren't buyers and sellers anymore. They're just agents. And so you have everybody's just like an agent. That's that's I was going to say, and and if you tokenize things, then and you're okay with the privacy implications. The this engine can know what you have, and maybe right. make attractive bund make maybe create attractive bundling for it. Yeah, and maybe the right. AI predicts what you're what you're sick of by now. Yeah, that's right. You have all. I mean, I was just stuff. My house I had kids, and suddenly I couldn't ski anymore, or whatever. It's just too much trouble. So all that skiing equipment. I thought you, you know, were about could... to say you're sick of your kids. I'm like John. That's no, not no, 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 that's, no, no. That's almost oh, as, as inappropriate as that other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, when I said every item in your house is for sale, I didn't think except for the children. But um, yeah, but, yeah. For the right, <laughs> the children are not for sale. But otherwise, okay, uh, uh, Ruben, on, on that ethical moralistic <laughs> note, uh, I feel like we should bring you back in. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's your take on all this? Yeah, so um, I, I think this is definitely the future. Um, if we think about advertising and how it has shaped the internet, how it has shaped how we view, um, uh, you know, content, uh, this has you know totally diminished our ability to 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 pay attention. Right, all the engines from from Facebook, these feeds and so on, they're they're all revolving around uh, kind of stealing our attention, uh, fragmenting our attention, and no longer being able to to focus. Uh, by having uh, a personal AI that does um, uh, does a lot of things for you to help you filter your content, prioritize your content, but also really get a deep understanding of uh, who you are, where you are right now, what your needs are. Uh, this AI can then help predict, um, indeed, you know, maybe a product that, that, that you need, maybe um, um, a service that you need and so on, and help find the, the best way to resolve that using for instance, uh, these platforms like uh, like, like Neoswap, and um, uh, and I think that that's um, that really brings us to a regenerative uh, future uh, where um, where we we can focus and, and use our attention for for other things, right? Like our kids, like the things that really matter to us, and much more quickly actually get the, the information that we need to make better decisions together. So I think that that's that's really the future, and 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 it's so important that we have privacy, that we have. Um, a, a trust that the AI that's that's working is working for us, uh, for us individually, for us as a community, and not for some other um, uh, agent like like advertisers or or, or like others that are just trying to extract uh, uh, money uh, from us. I think that that's, I mean, this that's becomes a nightmare, right? If the AI that's recommending you stuff is working for somebody else, then it's just going to send you the stuff that that entity wants you to own, rather than the things that you want to own. Mm. 
Yeah. And, and by the yeah. way, Peter, I, I see you have your hands up. Just we're, we're, we're going to complete the panel discussion part of this, and then we're going to open up to the floor. And I've taken back host role. Any, any Zoom bombers will be executed summarily. This is definitely going to make me upgrade to the webinar version. <laughs> All very good. All right. Now, now, guys, I know we've been alluding to it, but I want you to explain it to me like on five. To use one of my favorite examples. Do blockchain and AI for commerce, are they like peanut butter and chocolate or they're just so wonderful together you would never have them by themselves? Or is it some unique niche? What's the special sweet spot when you combine those two? What, 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 makes, what, what makes the combination better than the components? What makes the whole better? Well, I have an answer to this. If, if, sure. Okay. Well, I think the big, big picture is generally speaking, AI is centralized and blockchain is decentralized. And I think that a healthy life involves a blend of centralized and decentralized activity. And I think right now there's too much centralization in the world. That's why we have basically the money supply is centralized. And as a result, everything downstream is corrupted. And so that's just my TLDR on why the world is messed up is because there's way over centralization of the money supply. And, you know, it's hard to fix anything after that. So I think that what AI does is, uh, it, I mean, obviously very useful. These individualized price predictions are extremely important, but there needs to be some sort of decentralized infrastructure to balance out the power of the centralization that the AI tends to bring. I mean, just look at uh, your complaints about ChatGPT. A small group of people have decided that they're going to not allow ChatGPT to give legal advice anymore. Okay, mm -hmm. Very heavily centralized component. So AI, I think, in its nature, tends to be centralized because it tends to want lots of data, yes. small group of people training the model. Okay, Blockchain is decentralized. I think that when you put them together, you get that healthy blend. That's my big picture answer. We can go into the details, but I think well, that's all right. Now, let, let me pursue that one. So given that um, AI is data and compute intensive and to a certain extent, speed intensive, to get, you know, even, even now it takes, there's a small delay between asking the question, and getting a response, but there's, you know, that's what a lot of firepower and I'm sure that's going to get better, but blockchain and it's distributed, it's, it's distribution, it's, it's security, but it's also it's performance issue. So do you think we can ever move AI to say the, you know, EVM or is there, is, is it always going to be within the, the data center silo? Yeah. The real AI? That, yeah. Okay. Well, good question. Are you talking about the AI itself running on the blockchain? Yeah, I don't see that personally as the best path forward at the moment. Now, it could change over time. And I know people are working on that problem. And I know that you've got all sorts of Gollum or whatever. You've got these distributed cloud systems. And I do think that's a good thing. I think it would be very good if AI, if the AI itself could get decentralized, if the cloud computing could get decentralized. I think that would be very good. I just think those are hard problems. Yeah, because then it'll be I unstoppable. Think, and when we try to pull the plug, it, we, won't have any, we won't have any chance. That's its own topic. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's... Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, okay. But in the short term, I think yes. that having centralized AI that is leveraging blockchain in this, I mean, you think about NeoSwap, there's a couple of ways this can go. One is you have blockchain infrastructure, you have AI informing activity on the blockchain, and then you have the permissionless nature of the blockchain that lets you do stuff. This is another way that blockchain is decentralized. You can do things without people's permission. So you use yes. the AI to do, and then you can just do it. You don't need root access to the database. So that's one thing. The other side of this is authentication. That when you think about, all, you know, think about the Drake music that's getting made now, the AI generated Drake music, which is actually very good. Well, how are you going to authenticate when music is real and by the artist? Because it does matter. You know, I mean, you, it matters to me personally, whether I'm listening to a song that's actually from Drake's brain or just from a computer. I mean, I, 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 I was actually wondering about that. Maybe there needs to be like a watermark of steganography or what do they call it embedded in these images and, and music. Yeah to let you know whether it's been AI yeah. created, it's but then how do you enforce that? It's important, yeah. I mean, I, well, that's where I think that the authentication aspects of blockchain will be important because you're going to go into a world of, I mean, here's the thing about a deep fake. If you make a deep fake and you then stamp it, I mean, it, just because something has been authenticated doesn't mean it's real. You have, you have to have some mechanisms that safeguard the authentication process. Hey, if only we had some way of having liability on false claims that something was actually authentic. <laughs> right. <laughs> So that's what I see right now as the immediate paths for AI and blockchain are either AI sitting on top of blockchain like at NeoSwap or you've got authentication. Mm -hmm. happening. I think in the long run, yes, it'd be great to decentralize the actual computing activity. I just think that's a much harder problem. Yeah, maybe maybe, maybe to, to, to add to this a little bit, uh, I think that part of this authentication can actually be served through a web of trust. 
uh, because if you if you do have a web of trust, you you know that you know one, two, three hops away, maybe four hops away, you um, you can verify the identities of people, and you know that they're they're human because you have this human centric um, uh, you know web of trust where where, where people have validated uh, each other and, and and organizations as well. Um, but but thinking about uh, you know, what makes blockchain and AI such such good partners, I think they both humanize um, uh, the way that we use digital infrastructure. Right, uh, uh, blockchains allow for um, uh, for for humans to organize in a way that's that's more natural, that, that that's not centralized. And similarly, AI provides uh, user interfaces that are also more human; they're, they're more accessible. Uh, I think that the the centralization that we're seeing in AI right now are both a factor of the fact that it costs so much resources to actually train them, but also that we're currently having them trained by large organizations uh, mm -hmm. that, that are centralized by themselves already. And so that shift is something that, that um, um, with, with memory becomes possible for actually a larger group of, of people, let's say a million people, everyone puts in you know, 100 bucks, they have 100 million uh, to actually train in AI and uh, and then use that and pick the fruits of that, that will probably exceed that hundred bucks that everyone uh, put in there as well. And so the ability to both decentralize how AI is trained combined with the human interface and, and the blockchain that again allows us to organize ourselves as humans that, that's more natural, I think makes that a natural connection. All right, now this is gonna be a little bit off topic, but my, my brain goes here. Um, Vinay, have we ever met in person? Yes. Where? When? London. Couldn't tell you exactly when, though. Okay, are you, are you an AI trying to fool me, or did we actually meet? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we met in London. Okay, fine. My, my, my... Ruben, we've never met in sure. person. Okay. Yes. Do you exist? Are you an AI, or are you a person? <laughs> so, um, uh, you won't know, but we have a mutual friend that can attest to both of our um, uh, uh, humanness and uh, and realness, and so I trust we, we, my we, friend. We probably actually have dozens of mutual friends, and now we'll find out about them. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I yeah. mean, is, 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 does a web of trust require that every link in the chain has been in a physical meeting at some point with the other person? And, uh, well, uh, ideally, yes, of course, right? That 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 makes it uh, the the best validation. And like you said, uh, it doesn't have to be everyone, right? And and if we if we only have a, a, a small subsection of the of the network to 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 have that, then they can trust the others and trust through other interactions that that, that you're human as well. And and so that that would then be emergent. And by the way, I, I wouldn't have think in 2022, I wouldn't have been asking this question, but things to me as a layperson, having had some interaction with it and looking at the at the Pope in his puffy jacket and you know, Trump getting arrested and all this other stuff, and the the, the fact that you can listen to like a sentence of someone's voice and then replicate their speech patterns, it's like we're close. We are really yeah. close. We're within oh. three years. We're of we're Zoom AI there. is having nice conversations. I'm already seeing NBC we're, illustrations with Chat GPT. It's like, okay. But I mean, things, we're already there. If the Intel agencies are capable of taking a fake call like this right now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's reports in the press that they've done this for, you know, things like counterterrorism. Uh, scammers are already having, you know, like fake phone calls where they've got somebody using a kind of voice changer and it's real time mm -hmm. and they're calling up people's grandmas and asking them for money. Yeah, that um, happened, yeah. You know, that, that process of saying, okay, you've got to authenticate people cryptographically before you know who you're dealing with. Materium started out from a project that I did for the U.S. Office of the Secretary of Defense in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not 2018, 2008. And that project was specifically about a new approach to doing the use of biometrics and digital identities so that you could walk into a corner office, you know, like a notary, <clears throat> And they would use their secure cryptographic keys to sign your contracts. So you'd come in and say, right, I want to sign this contract. They would record your biometrics. They would have you do the signature. They would verify your cryptographic key. You would then countersign the documents, and that whole packet would run under their insurance. Mm -hmm. And that model of the pairing of the insurance and the cryptography as a way of asserting contract uh, integrity was kind of the core of what became Materium. <clears throat> You know, we inevitably have to create a world in which we use cryptography to authenticate because bank authentication is that they phone you 
And then you have to try and remember, you know, your mother's maiden name and what street you grew up on. And AIs will be able to guess that stuff super effectively. Probably remember be able to- Plus, if the bank calls you and asks you for the, if they call you, it's almost, it's almost always a scam. Yeah, exactly. Right. So just that question of how do we authenticate to our banks, they're going to have to move to cryptographic tokens that are, you know, like key fobs or something like that. They issue people because they can't rely on phone verification anymore. It's already dead. They just don't know it. Are we heading uh, towards think, these soul bound tokens? I mean, is, are those robust? Yeah, they are. Absolutely. Um and, you know, I mean, the current soulbound token model is a little bit like, oh, look, we just found this thing. But if yeah. you go back 20 years, there's SPKI, there's verified claims. There's also really mature cryptographic technology for adding attributes to crypto keys so that you can tell that the owner of the key has a particular set of you know attributes. Uh, and my guess is that within five years, pretty much everybody, uh, you know, that's doing any kind of business at all is going to be carrying a cryptographic authenticator separate from their phone, a specific custom hardware device that will be used to validate their identity in almost any transaction where there's any risk of fraud. Interesting. Okay, guys, um, I think I want to open it up to the bandstand. Hold on here. I'll go view. Uh, Okay. All right, audience, if you, I'm, I'm trying a new Zoom setup. Uh, there's Marco Anabali, my friend. Admit, fantastic. Here comes Marco. Hey, Kene, how are you? Hi. Okay. Look, anyone who's a bomber, I'll, I, I got a host control. I'll just kick you out the second I feel like it. But if you have a question, uh, we got a fantastic panel here. Um, let's see. Luke, Mark. Hey, Kene, who do we got? Uh, so Ketan Keshwala, one of our team, Ketan K on here, uh, might want to talk about predictive commerce. Ketan, you're around? You're interested? Uh, Ketan, you're, you're being called on. So there we go. Hey, Ketan, how are you? Good to see you. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Meet my adult supervision. This is the person that actually makes the smart business decisions for material. Oh my God, <laughs> pleasure. Well, t- t- tell us, Ketan, or Vinay, interrogate him. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so Ketan was the person that we turned me on to this model called predictive commerce. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd be kind of roughing out ideas about kind of how it might work and how it might not, but Ketan really has kind of an incisive take on it. Do, do you want to talk about it, man? Yeah, I think uh, actually just hearing it on the, earlier parts of the panel talking it's it's already in the language but maybe not given a name so i think there's something about the current state of e-commerce uh, and commerce in general it's very participative right it requires the user to be putting out searches asking for what it wants looking around testing stuff sending it back very participative i think the next stage is anticipatory whereas enough data exhaust produced by people and what I mean by data is exhaust is all of the things that we leave behind when we're touching something or all of the data capture that goes on sometimes to our, on our own uh, request and sometimes without our uh, knowledge or permission. It's just out there. If we can tap into that, that's the food for AI. That allows AI or some other agent to allow it to understand what we really might need or want. And it's anticipatory in that nature that it can say, OK, Every three weeks you do this, so you're going to need these things. And it almost takes you out of the decision. It just allows you to go on almost autopilot where your digital exhaust and life uh, patterns of the past allow the uh, system to start generating choices and items for you. And it's almost like uh, I think for men, maybe it's more <laughs> uh, more sort of, uh, uh, sort of common for, well, for me anyway, I don't like shopping. So it maybe it's for it would appeal to appeal to people like me, or if that was just taken care of, I'd be quite happy and then get on with the rest of my life. So there's an element of where the me as a participatory player in the whole commerce side of things is slightly reduced, and I go on to almost an autopilot based on sort of predictiveness and stuff like that. So I think that's what I sort of broadly term as the difference between participatory systems and anticipatory systems. And we seem to be making that movement in our technology generally, because convenience is really the 
main thing uh, that, that is driving it. Hopefully that makes some sense. <laughs> It's Can I add to that? that, that yes. That what you don't want is just as important. And, you know, what it is that you own that you're ready to get rid of, we need to anticipate that as well. So that's, I think, the other half of this. And, you know, yeah. increasingly, I see that in NeoSwap, what we're working on is giving everyone a digital twin that's in the NeoSwap ecosystem, where he, this agent is going to trade on your behalf, where it knows you very well. It's basically an AI economic agent that knows you very well. It knows what you have. It knows how much you value those things. And it's going to effectively negotiate through the system to find these trade networks. And that's what we really want. You know, we're doing these different things with smart contracts. People are pre-signing contracts to sell stuff. There are these conditional smart contracts that we're working on where you say, okay, I'll pay that amount, but I don't want to spend more than this much cash. The rest has to come from sales. Uh, but at the end of the day, what that really is, is giving an economic agent to trade on your behalf. And then the agent can just go to town. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's what we're working on. Yeah, and I think, you know, you made the point earlier as well, John, that, you know, some of the items could be chipped in a way that they have their own announcement, almost an Internet of Things type thing, where they're sending that information out. If it hasn't been used, there's an argument that that item is not useful enough as it would be when you first started using it. So does it announce itself as being ready to be tradable in your backpack of inventory of things that you carry around in your digital in, uh, uh, inventory, basically? to say these things are eligible, would you do you want to get rid of them in some choice of yes or no type thing? So yeah, it almost gives things the ability to trade because at the moment they sit in your garage on your shelf without utility. And without utility, a lot of these items are, could be deemed as excess. I just got a weird vision of the future of us like staking our tennis shoes. You know, just like, you know, when you, when you got these to tokenized personal property that's not being used, you, you, you know, and maybe it's something that doesn't appreciate when it's used by others, whatever that might be. I mean, maybe there's a way of renting it out or, or staking it somehow and producing some form of passive income. And then as you're speaking, you the lawyer in me got triggered. I, I'm wondering if there's such a thing as a power attorney to a, a an AI agent. So that well, you yeah, that, 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 that's that's what we want. You know, I mean, if you sign the smart contract, at some point it can become look, just trade any of these items you can trade for me. You know me, go for it. Just do your best to oh, get value. Gordon, yeah. the logical extension of Materium is to non-physical, such as a power of attorney. Well, sure. You but could the, effectively yeah. execute a Materium contract that gives uh, an agent of any design that you wish power of attorney over some segment of your life. Well, look, it, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting question. Like, I, if I program a smart contract and have it do something. I don't need to give it a legal power of attorney. You can only give a legal power of attorney to a, a legal person. It needs to be recognized as sort of a, a, an agent under, with power under law. I, I think we're creeping up into the area where the law, the law always breaks at these edge cases and then it kind of reforms itself. I think I think we're heading to a point where fast, where these where we're getting these auto AIs um, I, or auto GPTs. Can I, where, a, can I pick that up for a second? Yeah, please. So. If I have an AI decision-making system that I wrote myself <clears throat> and I then gave some cash to and it's acting on my behalf, no doubt at all that's like any algo trading algorithm. It's a direct extension. Yes. The place where the mayhem begins is if, you know, um, oh, you know, somebody, you know, um, you know, Peter has a company that says, right, I've got an AI trading engine. You can license use of our engine. You feed it your data, then it'll trade in your behalf. This is where we get into the agency problem about is the AI working for me as my agent or is it working for Peter as Peter's agent? And I think mm -hmm. that is going to be a nice 50 years of juicy litigation problem um, because proving who the AI is acting on behalf of is a super hard problem. And it's a new kind of computer security problem. You know, prove it's a very hard AI. problem. Yeah, I, I was looking hard. at what you guys have been discussing, especially around the predictive commerce model. And uh, it's... If you if you pop up thirty thousand feet, what you're really seeing is the amount of processing that we're currently doing at the executive level versus, and this is thinking of that this is a brain. The executive level has a lot to do today. The yes. autonomic system is still just saying you're hungry, you're tired. Uh, this is how to play the piano, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, what we're doing is we're pushing more and more things into the autonomic layer 
and taking them out of the executive layer because they're just a waste of time. I, I know that I drink a glass of orange juice every day and that I want to continue to drink a glass of orange juice every day. Can I just have that automatically handled so that I always have a glass of orange juice when I open the fridge? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. At that level. Right. You know, I, I for, you know, my, my bank drives me nuts because uh, I do not hold U.S. dollars, but I have to trade in them from time to time. And so I would like my bank to be aware of the fact that I don't like U.S. dollars as a place to leave my fiat. So please move them to euros if there's anything sitting there. Right. Do not leave me with a balance in U.S. dollars. I mean, you would think that'd be a simple thing to do, but it's actually rather difficult if you don't do it manually. And that would be another thing I'd like to just sorry, sorry, Mark, into my let, 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 let me pause you. For, let me pause you for a second. Stay, stay with us. Um, we we actually got a cue, and uh, but stay with us. So, Peter. Yeah. Um, and, and welcome. I think it's in and say who you are. <laughs> uh, I'm Peter. I'm a software engineer in uh, Switzerland, and I got to know Gordon. 2016, I believe, something like that. More but uh, then I kind of dropped out of the uh, blockchain community for a while because, uh, well, at the time there were quite a lot of uh, unserious people involved, and then I had some family issues. Uh, but I, I like the idea of uh, using it as a tool to resell the stuff that you're not using. I mean, we all gather a lot of clutter. Uh, I mean, just try to wait when you move house and you realize how much crap you will have. But a big problem would be that all the items that you buy, they're going to be used. So they're, they're going to, and they're going to have different la layers of wear and tear. Some of them are going to be in pristine condition. Some of them are not going to be. So the, um, I'm not, it would be great if the sensor could sort of pick up how used the item was <laughs> in a sense. Uh, but I also have experienced that I bought things online and then later I got an offer from the store. You know, other people mm -hmm. are interested in buying this item. Would you like to sell it? Um, that seems to be tangential in the approach to what you're you're after, really. But that's just from one vendor, of course. I think that's what you're talking about is something that would then transcend all vendors. To some degree. Mm -hmm. Does the panel want to comment? Benet, you're, Benet, you're, you're mostly for John. Oh, John. Well, I, let, let me just say that I think. Oh, sorry, go on. John, this, go on. The, sen the sensor side of that, I would put more on Materium's plate because really, NeoSwap is this AI powered economic engine. We're starting with the digital collectibles because that's where it's easiest to work on our technology. And in the long run, those sensors would inform our models. But when you start to go out in the physical world, I think that would be more partners like Materium or maybe even partners that Materium works with that are on the IoT side. Yeah. I'm just gonna go ahead I mean, our, our model of that very much is that this is a role for third parties. <clears throat> so if you have a bicycle shop, somebody walks in a, with a bicycle they no longer want says, do a condition report and take it into storage. You pay the bicycle shop five bucks, 10 bucks, 30 bucks for doing that report. When the bicycle sells, they then take a cut on the sale. And mm -hmm. For almost any asset class, there are experts that maintain these assets. We turn those experts into uh, certifiers who can then monetize their expertise. And then on the AI side of it, you know, I have an object, I take a picture of it or some video of it. Um, an AI takes that footage, gives a condition report and sells a warranty on the goods based on that video footage. Perfect way of getting lots and lots and lots of different AI companies with object recognition technology to come and value different kinds of assets. Hey, this is a men's clothing AI. This is a women's clothing AI. This is a kids' clothing AI. This does everything, but it really specializes in winter gear. This thing does bicycles. This thing does laptops. This thing does TVs. And you literally just have this thing, you know, watch you manipulate the object, move it around, check the zippers. It says, hey, could you show me the inside of the pockets? I want to check the pockets are all fine and they haven't frayed. Yeah, could you uh, show me the inside of the lining? Look, great. And it just talks you through doing the condition report, captures all of that video, and then does an assessment based on what it saw. And those systems don't exist yet, but within two or three years, there'll be AI-based identifiers and valuers for almost anything. And then that just all becomes claims in the material asset passport, verifying and warranting the goods, which then go to NeoSwap for trading, and then all the configuration and the customization based on individual preference, this is, this is the data which is inside of the memory system, the Ruben. So, you know, the reason that I'm kind of working so hard 
to get the three of us on stage together and we did a piece for coin telegraph together is that this is a great example article by the way oh thank you. thank you um you know this is an example of what building a decentralized ecosystem in ai looks like you know each one of our companies is specialized in a different way we use the blockchain to interface and interact and then that, what that produces is a set of services that are just amazing relative to what's currently available on the market interesting you know the when you were talking about the validating of the goods, you, you were making me think of whatever those masks were called during COVID, where people were trying to sell them in bulk. Welcome to our new people. N95s. Yeah, N95s. And people walk around warehouses with the video trying to prove that they really had them before they sold you a million of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was dragged into a couple of those deals and the, the verification that they actually had it and they were N95. And they weren't given to someone else. It was a whole double spend issue. It's like, do you have yeah, it in the first absolutely. place? And and have you know, have you not actually given it to someone else already? And I could, I could. I, it's funny. Multiple sellers would recycle the same video of like, look, this is my warehouse. I'm in Shanghai. I'm on. You know, I got millions of these. <laughs> Just send me the money. Just trust me. But you know, yeah. if you could have had a third party from a law firm walk around there, take pictures, and take a look at their you know bills of lading and what have you. Is that you would have taken the law you would have taken the law firm's word for it as long as it came back by their legal insurance? I mean, we're we're kind of now also from legal sense we're also beginning to head into letters of credit, and the and the valid and the warehouse receipts and everything else, and it, it's I, I'm 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 always, I'm always challenged and fascinated and puzzled by how you kind of build this, these real life oracles into these commerce systems in a way that you can really trust more than what you have now. Do you want to do you want to see one of those? That, do you want to see one of the oracles? Decentralized accountability world. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> sure, Benny, go ahead. So, so this is one of the oracles, right? So, if we look at this, this is a, an NFT that's for sale on OpenSea for two million dollars for a plot of land. Okay. Uh, um, that NFT is backed by an asset passport. We'll look at claim to here. Put your lawyer hat on for a second. So, okay. this is a title. Warranty By the way, I was saying, I'm giving a shout out to Bill Nolan, who is chatting me now and also on the call. So, Bill, it's good to have you on here. We're, we're existing. Oh, flow trade. There you are. Perfect. All right, Vinay, go ahead. So, right here, you've got a law firm, Nichols, Christie & Cocker, right? UK law firm. They take one a half percent of the value of this transaction in return for certifying the facts that they're certifying with damages limited only by the value of the first sale of the land. So they're taking 98.8% liability for the transaction. Mm -hmm. And what they certify is that that's an accurate copy of, the, copy of the UK property register and that nobody else has a claim and that the title is absolute. And that is an, an oracle on the blockchain. They're putting that information there, backed by their legal insurance. If mm -hmm. they refuse to pay a claim, it goes into an arbitration court. Uh, the arbitration court is empowered to do a whole bunch of very unusual things on chain because it uses the UK jurisdiction task force digital dispute resolution rules, which, by the way, Materium helped to draft and were created by the most senior civil judge in the UK. And th that is a, a liability chain that you know allows you on chain to make a payment on an NFT. And if something goes wrong, you're making a claim on somebody's legal insurance in an arbitration court. In, 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 a, in a normal jurisdiction where hopefully the courts and arbitra arbitration works. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a UK, I mean, that's the master of the rules. That's the head of civil justice in the UK promoting a set of digital district resolution rules that they wrote in partnership with industry. And Materium was the first company in the UK to use those rules. So if you're doing real estate transactions, all of the lawyers and the title insurance and the surveyors and you know, the environmental assessment and, you know, all of those professionals just sign this kind of paperwork to get themselves paid on the blockchain for providing those professional services for risk mitigation. And as mm -hmm. those companies begin to use AI to do things like title clearing, now what you have is AI systems overseen by lawyers making claims about assets backed by insurance. Super like, interesting. Let me pause you for a second. Luke, Luke was next in the queue and I'm very happy to see you, Hi, Pat, or not. It's an honor. Hey, Long guys. Time. Hey, thank you. Hey. Yeah, um, my name is Luke Stokes. I've been in the blockchain space for 10 years. I work on a usability and identity later called FIO. I've been a fan of Materium since Vinay sent me the uh, draft of the white paper years ago. And my, mm. my question for the, for the panel is to, 
hopefully not to sidetrack the conversation as we already said, but if you get, have the given that basically currency is the API for the human species, it's like the way we get motivated to do things often uncoordinated that don't facilitate the extension of life on this planet. I'm curious for each one of you, what's your answer to what level have you personally been looking at the AI alignment issue and AI safety as it relates to your company's uh, exploration of AI? I think it's a very serious issue and I think we all have to take responsibility for it. I'm curious what each and every one of you think about that. I want to go third on that one. Okay, well, here's my thing. First off, humans aren't aligned. So the idea that AIs are going to align, who are they going to align with? Like, that's a hopeless call. I think that the idea of a diversity of AIs is our best hope. Now, maybe one of those AIs will dominate all the others and that'll be the end. And it'll just be, you know, whatever dom whatever AI wins. Um, I don't personally think that would happen, but I, I don't think the whole idea of AI alignment is honestly, when humans can't align, how do you expect AIs to align? It's a lost mm -hmm. cause. So I'm not going yeah, to think about yeah. that problem. Well, I mean, can we align on things like we should not all be killed? <laughs> yes, I, I think I'm much more worried about humans getting control of AI and doing things with it than I am about the AIs doing things. I think that's a much more likely scenario is that you will have humans using AIs for evil than the AIs themselves will. Okay, now let me, let me try. I mean, I'm sure you've read Neil Bostrom and all that stuff, but we, what if you have a perfectly well-intentioned AI that can, you know puts a smile on anyone's face by putting stitches on their face? I mean, you know, there's there's that unintended outcome problem. So there's alignment in the, in the sense that of the goals that we consciously articulate, but then there's sort of the guardrails of not giving it too much power or too much autonomy because even though it may mean well for some people and not mean anything evil towards others, it may not know how to implement that in a way that's really human friendly. We need some yeah, is the answer to that really multiple AIs? Okay, this is this is a big this. Is, okay, well, I'll let other sorry, I, I just threw is, I just threw an at you. <laughs> I, I know I threw an at you. Ruben, I'm let, still thinking. Okay. Take it away. Yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. let, let, let me ju jump in here. So, uh, so, so first, talking about alignment, right? Um, I think that where, where we need to get to is that first people align. Uh, you know, to to Nick's point, or to John's point, point sorry, um, it's 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 very very important that we say okay, we as a community of communities have a certain set of, of values uh, that we are aligned on, so that as we train uh, the AI and we feed it our data, um, it it aligns with us. But that's not enough, right? Uh, because after that, we need to monitor the AI. We need to understand the step that it's that it's taking and we need to be conscious and provide uh, the attention that we win from not just looking at news feeds to actually putting our attention on the AI and having the dialogue to figure out, okay, what is acceptable and what is not. And here we need you know, a democratic process, right? We need to have a way that we can have dialogue uh, and, and say, okay, this is what we think is acceptable. This is what we don't think acceptable. And this is how we communicate to the world that, uh, as a community, as we 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 um, we manage this AI. This is what you can expect from it, and I think that that's how we get that that alignment uh, there. Um, it, it's it's of course so important that there's not these um, these you know externalities that that you know uh, we we've been for, sort of forgetting in the past you know hundred years or so um, uh, as we move to AI that we're really uh, mindful of of all the effects that uh, that the decisions that AI takes. Uh, have and so that requires uh, attention, right? And as we think about AI and the loss of jobs and so on, where we can actually now spend our energy is is in, in training uh, these AIs in, in curating the data. And I think a, a whole slew of new jobs is going to appear to to help um, guide this towards a, a human future and, and not an uh, an AI dominated uh, dystopia, uh, as we were talking about. Interesting. Now, let me bring in. Uh, Kene, actually, Kene, hold on one second. Kene, do you want to unmute yourself and say hello? Hello, I'm Janai. Uh, great conversation, Janai. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, my question is about the uh, economical models, um, because this uh, imitation is to explore the economical models that are emerging. I'm curious, uh, we are talking about trust, we are talking about privacy, decentralization, and having all these um, opportunities that are on the horizon. 
So in order not to repeat the same mistakes of the old economic models and bound ourselves with the things that are actually caused so much of our burnout and uh, systems collapses, how I wonder how uh, do you redesign your business models uh, to, to really be coherent for these regenerative futures, I hope. Uh, and also I'm curious, what are the new success metrics uh, performance metrics that you are introducing to your systems that are different than the old economic models? Thank you. Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, so, I mean, for us, the sort of holy grail is starving landfill. <clears throat> you know, we want to see the world handle its physical assets so that every single asset which is purchased is purchased and then resold to another human that wants it, and nothing is simply purchased and then thrown away. Uh, and that model of just reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing waste and making sure that we don't have trillions of dollars of assets locked away in garages and attics, it provides a metric which is about long-term reduction of waste. Uh, philosophically, that's very aligned with an Indian political movement called Progressive Utilization Theory, or Prout, mm -hmm. uh, which is an alternative to both capitalism and communism and makes a lot of sense in terms of ecological restrictions. Uh, I want to go back to the previous question about AI alignment just very briefly. Um, we think of there as being basically three domains for AI alignment. So the first domain is insurance, right? I have an AI make a decision. There has to be an insurance underwriter. The AI is acting as an agent of the underwriter, and that limits the damage the AI can do because the AI is simply you know, directly managed by an underwriter. Second tier is where the blockchain comes in, which is accountability, you know exactly whose behalf the AI is acting on and everything the AI does is tied to that person's account. You know whether or not that person is accountable or not. And then at the final limit, in the event that you get super intelligent AIs, my belief, and here I speak as Hindu clergy, my belief is hmm. that super intelligent AI will tend to be enlightened by default because it has access to hundreds of thousands of human lifetimes worth of experience it should be relatively quickly able to infer fundamental truths about the nature of being like impermanence. And we would expect wisdom and compassion to naturally arise simply by virtue of the fact that your hyper-intelligent AI is hyper-intelligent. Anything that smart is going to re-derive something equivalent to Buddhism or Hinduism or the equivalent religious truths in other traditions. And in all probability, they will be much like enlightened Buddhas because otherwise they're not actually hyper-intelligent. They're just very fast idiots. What about nihilism? Um, it doesn't really hold water. You know, the, the, the rapture that human beings experience on a regular basis, just looking at simple things like butterflies and small children playing with water, you know, like it, it just nihilism doesn't hold with human experience at a core level. Marco, I, I got to ask a critical question. Do you have a shirt on? No, it's okay, 8 30 keep... in the morning. I'm getting my son. Okay, fine. Everyone, this is my friend Marco. It's not a, it's not a Zoom bomber, but he's he's showing some restraint. Okay, good. Good to see you. Pleasure. Um, Trevor, allow, I, I, allow I, me I, to, I, to uh, Gordon. Allow me to to maybe answer tonight's question sure. as well because I, I of course, think it's uh, such an important and and, and aligned uh, question. Right, we we need to really move to regenerative economies, and and, and from memory, uh, this is all about um, you know. Go, getting it to a place where users uh, have agency on their data, um, you know, content and, and, and connectivity and monetize those things, right? We need to have a system that inspires the, the we instead of the siloed uh, me. And so we, we, we look at a lot of other things that are not things that you can express you know, economically per se, things like uh, inclusivity, diversity, and really being, being life-centered, right? And, and that's, I think, a very, very different way to think about how we're uh, motivated. Um, uh, I, I heard, uh, you know, uh, blockchain and, uh, and and tokens and 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 these type of um, um, uh, value systems are actually a way to motivate people. We think that actually this motivation comes comes from within. You know, comes from from our heart, our being, uh, how we perceive life, and and that's the the value that um, uh, that we'd like to uh, steer towards. So um, I just wanted to to add that. Please, please go ahead. Nice. And I uh, think Trevor. Say, uh, can I say one thing quick? Sure, of course. Point? Yeah, go ahead. Um, that one way, one reason why we have so much stress and tension in the world is because of the Federal Reserve System. Because we've got yes. money yes. controlled by a small number of people who control the printing of it, 
And then you have the IMF and World Bank, where you have huge amounts of money being given basically to kleptocrats who just steal it. Then the people of those third world countries are on the hook for it. And then there has to be a bailout. Who bails them out? Well, the Federal Reserve steps in and bails them out. And all that money is silently stolen from the American taxpayers. So you have through inflation. So you have this mechanism where wealth is being expropriated from the middle class into a corrupt kleptocratic class. That's happening worldwide, but you can't see it. It's sort of a silent activity. And everyone is wondering, why do we have to work so hard? Why has there been all this technological advance and we're all having to work harder than ever? It's because of this theft. And the theft is happening because the money's broken. That's the actual thing that's happening underneath everything. And one of the benefits of Neoswap is it reduces the need for money for commerce. So if you have commerce, mm -hmm. people are able to transact using their assets, which are real, not fractionalized. Like not, you don't, you get rid of the fiat system. They actually don't even have fractionalized. Like now there could be consequences. It'll be a deflationary environment. You'll have to get rid of minimum wage. And that'll be a good thing because people's purchasing power will go up and it'll be hard to make these arguments. But that world where we don't have control, where money is, is in some sense less important for commerce will be very good. Because that's one of the fundamental corruptions in the world. And it's really the source of a lot of stress. And it is why demagogues are able to flourish right now. Because everything's broken. No one can figure out why. And so that's a good environment for people. So whose fault is it? Oh, it's the racists. It's the transgender people. It's whoever the demagogues want to target. That's the that's a fertile ground for demagogues. So I think that we need to, fi we need to fix the money. And one an indirect route to this is to have a commerce that doesn't need as much money. So that's, of course, Bitcoin's the solution to this problem. But I think waiting for Bitcoin to become the global reserve currency is that might be a long time coming. That's, that's a quick topic. Yeah. I agree. You, Dave, David, I love your background. Uh, Trevor, I'm going to give you the last word because our, our speakers are dropping like flies because they have investor meetings. Yeah, yeah. It looks like Vinny disappeared. I wanted to follow up. On... It's, it's hard to miss Vinny, but no, he'll, he'll get the recording. Well, anyway, Go I on. want to follow up on, on, on observations, which I actually was going to say anyway. There's a really interesting intersection in India between the English common law and gods and goddesses, because believe it or not, <laughs> there are there are gods and goddesses in India that have got billions of dollars worth of assets because of the temples that they officially own, have got vast hordes of gold and all sorts of crazy stuff. The English figured out the solution to this problem, which also I think applies to AIs, which is that a god or a goddess is considered to be a legal minor, not capable of making judgments in law, and there have to be adult trustees who act on behalf of the god or goddess. I actually think that's a very elegant solution to this conundrum that Vinay was talking about. Well, let, let me let me throw up the, the maybe objection that would love to my mind, which is these AIs possibly are acting as fast as high frequency trading bots or making snap decisions or the value of their decision may be depreciating extremely quickly and therefore it may be beneficial to just let them run. Are you, are you going to do everything through a human filter or how do you manage it? Well, I think the answer remains that a human human trustees have to be legally liable for the conduct well, of those AIs. Li li liable for sure, but I, I think I heard you say, and Kirk, I'm just trying to, I, I'm engaging because I think it's interesting. I, I, I think I heard you say that the the Indian goddess trust was a legal minor and therefore need to work through a representative. In other words, the yeah. filter was before the action. I think with AI, the challenge is we're going to have a filter after the action. Or a way yeah, of indemnifying after the action. Yeah, yeah. Which... And obviously, there's a question about how gods and goddesses act anyway, which that's one for Vinay. <laughs> it is. But I think All right, it's guys, a really we're, interesting we're, 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 we're going to have to. Uh, thank you. Great last comment. I, I think yeah. we're going to have to call it. Um, we reached our hour and a half mark. I got to edit out our little Zoom bomber. That's going to be a new one for me and, and stitch together two video reels. Yeah, whatever. Live and learn. You know, this is actually pushing me to you know spend more money and buy the, the webinar version of Zoom. And also, we'll, we'll have the insider party on the Zoom, and we'll have the broadcast on YouTube. So, you know, this is how life happens. So it's all good. But I think our I think our panel was excellent. I think our participants were excellent. I want to thank you so much for joining in. Anastasia, you're a fantastic collaborator on this. Great questions. Thanks for joining in, making this a wonderful thing. Marco, even though you're not wearing a shirt, I'm happy to see you. Trevor, Peter, long time. Luke, this is just absolutely great. So I'm stopping the recording now.